Give order another No. Just give out any bulb and screw in there and I'll let you go. Are you done with that? Eat your pickles? Yeah, I'm done with that. Then don't go away, I'll eat it. I'm gonna wait up. Old school phone. That's brand new phone. It's heavy. All right. I think we're all here, ready to go. I'm gonna mute everybody. Got chicken all over me. We're in the south. I guess that's what they do. All right, this is Ahmed for DCs, and this is our Lunch and Learn. We have it every week, 1 to 3 p.m., and uh, we're here every single week. we got a lot of exciting news every week to share. Dr. Raker just took a phone call. I'm going to bump down the audio on this a little bit so I can hear myself think. We're going to let people come in and come on board. And, and so we've got Dr. Raker answering a DOT question right now. We've been going through those all week. We're going to talk about a few of those and discuss many other things today. We're going to go over uh, this potential problem that seems to be growing is certain carriers are refusing to pay for uh, uh, chiropractic CMEs and performing DOT physicals. We're going to talk about that today uh, with Mr. Ho. He's going to be our special guest. And so as soon as Dr. Raker gets over here, we're going to get started. It takes about five minutes for people to get on. Join the meeting. Come on. Uh, uh, they're what I call our procrastinators. They kind of wait to the last minute to get on. So we'll wait on them. I'm going to let people in. If you would, check your uh, microphone and make sure you're muted. I'll mute everybody anyway. You'll be allowed to talk if we select you or call on you to ask you a few questions. We would like to answer those. Uh, if, but we prefer you to ask questions in the chat room. That way we have a record of them. And uh, again, this is recorded and we're going to put it on the Lunch and Learn uh, archives uh, soon after. Hopefully today I'll get it on, on there. And for all you millennials out there that has bought your Turner Overdrive, if you lived in the late 70s, you'll know who I'm talking about. They had that southern rock sound. For sure. All right. Let's turn that off. Let's see if we can get people in and get started here. Now, let's go over what we're going to do today. Dr. Rikers says that we're supposed to knock a, put a knot on their head or something. I didn't quite hear him. Let's go over uh, what we're going to go over here today. Here, let me find my email. And what we're going to cover. We still got people coming on board. We got a few more to go before we get started. We have our special guest. He's in the bullpen waiting to go. He's waiting to go on. He's in on deck. He's on deck waiting to go into the uh, into the uh, batter's box. So let's talk about this. This is uh, Mr. Hogue. He is executive director of the Chiropractic Defense Council. This is a 501c3, so you donate to this. It does, uh, I believe, a tax write-off. So, <laughs> gosh, you know, how, what better way to help your profession? So, let's see what we can do here and uh, find him. I'm going to let well, him. I'm here, my friend. There you are. All right. <laughs> 
All right. How are you doing today? We're living the dream as always. And yourselves? Are you, are you living down in South Florida? No, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. We have several doctors right now about to get slammed. Fleeing from the hurricane. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, our prayers are with them. And we've got about five or six Med doctors right on that coast. So on the, on the west side of Florida. Okay, let's but, get started. What yeah, uh, yeah, we've got more three or four people still waiting to get on. Um, let me do something quick just to let the rest of these people in. Uh, just a re quick reminder, and then we'll kind of get Baron going. All right. So anybody that's um, I met them. Anybody that's listening in, if if we've talked about getting in the Form Fox Network in the past, I have sent an invite. You should receive it on your cell phone, an invite from, I'm not exactly what, sure what it's going to say, but it should say something about form box. Just follow the rules on that so that we can get you into the form Fox network and get everything set up. Um, and then I'll do a touchback in another week here with those that haven't made it that far to get everybody kind of in on this thing. But I need everybody that have already got potentially like written in and set up in the form Fox network, you should get an invite on your phone. So follow the prompts, whatever it says to do. And what are the procedures <laughs> for our new doctors signing up with CRL? Uh, I mean, we have a bunch that's come in the last couple of weeks. So the, the sign up is still essentially the same. There's a, uh, the form that you have in the membership area to mm -hmm. sign up with CRL. It's a three page form, fill it all out send it to me on one of the forms that says send to CRL. Don't do that. Send all three pages to me, fax them to me. And then I set everything up from there on the, on the form Fox network. And then that's where this invite comes in. Once I put all your info in, I send you an invitation. You have to follow the rules on that invitation to open it up and get it going. All right. So let's get, let's, that being said, let's get Baron going. So, so I've been chasing Baron for about a year. <laughs> and it was just lucky that I was teaching in Louisiana and he was teaching. Somebody told me he was there and I went running down there and I caught him before he left um, to tell him what, a little bit about what was going on. So, Baron, just kind of introduce yourself and, and, and the defense council. Right, and Baron, let me do one thing. I'm going to mute everybody and, and then you're going to unmute yourself again. Okay. That'll keep the background noise down. All right. Now. All right. Well, listen, uh, Dr. Raker, I greatly appreciate the opportunity and Dr. Herbert for uh, uh, briefly talking with your crew here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Baron Hoig. I am the executive the director meeting. of the uh, Chiropractic Defense Council. Um, we're actually, our organization is one chiropractic, which is a C6. Um, and then we also have a C3 that's within it. So we're, we're kind of a, a larger organization, but specifically with the Chiropractic Defense Council, our goal is protecting the rights of practicing chiropractors. We're an agnostic organization. We do not pick a side of vitalistic to mechanistic. Honestly, that conversation's so old, I'm tired of having it. Um, and we need to just start defending the rights of our practicing chiropractors. And so that's what we're doing. Um, we have attorneys all over the country, all over the world. We operate in eight different countries. Um, we were the first to start working on, you know, when there were mandates to shut people down if they weren't going to get vaccinated. Um, we're dealing with x-ray issues in Canada. We're dealing with licensing board issues when licensing boards are really overstepping their authority um, and harassing chiropractors. We step in and do that work. Um, really anywhere that there's any kind of a restriction on a chiropractor's ability to operate within the framework that currently exists, we are there to defend them. Um, we're a very simple organization. Um, we're all contributor based. We we just ask people to contribute thirty three dollars a month, um, and and that's that's really it. And that gives us the funding we need to take on these battles um, at any point. So Dr. Raker actually tracked me down and um, and explained to me what's been going on with the DOT and how although federally. DC qualifies as an examiner, we now have um, carriers, employers that are really putting their own definition of things um, uh, when it comes to who they authorize for exams. And so we actually are in the process of, of getting an attorney to actually work on that for us, to draft a letter, to get an official um, explanation from the federal government, from the Department of Transportation on exactly that language that exists within the DOT that says that that an employer can put more uh, 
stringent guidelines in place or add to the exam process to make sure that their drivers qualify a little higher, we do not believe that that actually constitutes for them to change the specialty of a healthcare provider. That is the government that says these provider types are qualified to do it. The employer can add a test or something of that nature, but not just outright discriminate against a type of provider. Um, and so we're going to work with an attorney to get that fixed um, as soon as we can. We're also working on um, some other issues where we now understand federal employees, FBI, Pentagon, other types of federal employees are currently not allowed to do their physicals with chiropractors, again, even though we're qualified in other departments of the federal government. So we're trying to, we're working on those things. We have our lobbyists already digging into the federal employee side um, and hopefully have that resolved here before too long. But our, our whole goal is to figure out where there are areas that chiropractors are being restricted. Our goal is to increase access. For example, I know in Washington, I got an email today from a doc stating um, that they can't, Washington does not recognize it even for DOT. Um, so we're going to work in that state as well. That was news to me. I did not know that. So I've already got my team working on what the issues are there in the state of Washington and why they are limiting chiropractors access, especially um, you know, north of Oregon, you know, Oregon's got one of the best scopes in the country. Um, I'm very surprised that Washington uh, has that restrictive. So we're going to we're going to be working on those types of issues. So anything that restricts the rights of a practicing chiropractor, we are going to um, aggressively go after that and and uh, make sure that our profession has the access that it needs to become the number one healthcare choice in the world. Um, so that doc, I don't know if I missed anything from our conversations, but uh, that's just a little bit about who we are and what we do. No, you did a really good job on that. Now, I can help you a little bit with the, there's three states, Washington, Michigan, and New York, that, and New York used to allow chiros to do DOT physicals, and it, it did an about face um, without going really long on that. All that happened was someone wrote a letter to the Department of Education and said, uh, we don't think Kairos are qualified to do this. And it launched an investigation. And basically the Fed said, until that investigation gets either done and, and figured out, we're going to suspend their well, ability. There, well, there, there was a problem with their scope of practice as it only allowed the examination procedure for the detection of a subluxation. Well, that's, that's exactly what Washington and I believe Michigan I went through Washington. I've even had conversations with the Washington State Board member of some kind. Every single part of the exam is within this chiropractic scope of practice. There's not a problem with doing something. Even the urinalysis is allowed. What it boiled down to is their state law says they can do an examination for the purpose of detecting and correcting subluxations. So they just, they can do a DOT physical, but they can't sign the form saying it's for driving a right. truck. Right. That's, that's the holdup in Washington. And I think it's very similar holdup in Michigan and New York is just because of the wording of their scope. Not that well, that's on our radar. So we'll, we'll start reaching out to state associations and figuring out uh, it's a small fix. Theoretically should be. Um, and uh, yeah, well, it's on our radar. And those are areas that where it's restricting a chiropractor's ability to operate. So we're going to dig into that. The, the other issue is the word physician. And, uh, you know, in Texas, we used to be called chiropractic physicians. Mm -hmm. And we gave up the word physician about 20 years ago over a fight over the ability to do school physicals. We traded one for another. That was the worst mistake we could have made because it really limited us in a lot of these exams that we did. Yeah. And so getting that position <laughs> attached to our scope of practice in language, in the law, in statute is critical, uh, I think, to the success of the business that we want to do. Well, and just to give you a little bit more on that part, Baron, there's 28, I believe, 28 states that we are called chiropractic physician. Mm-hmm. That word went, went from the federal government, such as doing um, FAA private pilot flight physicals, they simply said, you, a physician, they used the term physician. If you're a physician, you can fill out this form. So in those states, those 28 states that were called a physician, we can fill out that form to a private pilot flight physical and get paid for it, no problem. In the states that we don't have that word physician attached to us, it seems like that then makes that a denial. Um, so that word physician being attached is 
is like Dr. A. Bear said, is pretty critical. Um, I don't have, I do have a map that has the different states listed as which ones say physician and which ones don't. So if that, if you need that, I'll send that to you just so that's on your radar also. Yeah, if you'll send it, that'd be great. I mean, I think I have that information somewhere as well with my work with FCLB, but yeah, if it, you could send it to me so it's handy, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, Dr. Dan, uh, Dr. Dan's officer in TCA, it was over 20 years ago, we <laughs> lost physician in, uh, status in uh, Texas. And I thought it was over school physical. He may have more information on that. Just add it here. So, yeah, I think it's important to that we push that legislation through. Now, do you work with the ACA at all? Uh, no, I don't work with any other national organization for a million and a half different reasons. Um, but we, you know, I communicate with everyone. You know, we're we work with the Cairo Congress. We work with all state associations. Um, it's just our national organizational structure is, is broken as everyone's aware. And there's a lot of turf war issues there. So I just, I don't deal with any of it. I'm agnostic. I just want to get the work done and not be slowed down. That's one of the unique things about our organization is we're not a member organization. I don't need to sit and get a board of delegates. I don't need to ask my members to do stuff. We're a contributor based organization that's driven to expand the access of chiropractic. And so we, you know, we can, just move on these things very quick. So when we start working with it, whether it's a state or a federal association, although we're always going to communicate, there's never going to be a surprise about what we're doing. I don't have the handcuffs that a lot of those organizations do to move on things that need to be moved on. Um, and a perfect example was the the vaccine mandates, we were the only organization that was moving as quickly as we did, hired 15 attorneys, immediately started defending because I didn't have to wait on a board to approve. I didn't have to worry about pissing off half of my membership. You know, it was, we're just, we're like the Navy SEALs that when, when they're that type of a fight is going, we're going to get deployed. And when we're done, we're out. Um, you know, so we work very well with state associations. They actually like us because they don't take the arrows. So if I was going to go into Washington and we were going to work on that term physician, uh, or exams for the purposes of more than just a subluxation, that's going to fire the right up pretty hard, right? You know, our vitalistic guys that don't think chiropractors should do anything other than treat a subluxation. So when the association tries to take that on, they lose a percentage of their membership saying, oh, here we go. It's going that direction. When we do it as a defense organization, no one really gets their hair up in arms as much as they would. You know what I'm saying? So we become an asset to these organizations to be able to do the work that needs to be done without ruining political ties that anyone may or may not have. So we communicate with everyone. I will sit down and talk and include and share. Our whole operation is an open book on our website, everything from our finances to our objectives. I record a video every Monday telling everybody what we're doing. Um, so there's no secret, there's no cloak and dagger, but I refuse to get held down by the bureaucracy of how our profession currently operates. I, I love that. Um, a little background on this, some of the DOT stuff, because I've been doing this for over 30 years. I seen a little bit of this discriminatory action back in the day, but it really seemed like it went away, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago. I hadn't really heard of it much. And then after this certification process went through in 2016, where we all had to be certified to do DOT exams, I thought, well, that's, you know, we're all certified. That's going to be gone. And I really didn't hear much about it until just this last year, I started getting calls from a couple of doctors in different states saying, hey, this carrier, they, they say, go get your DOT physical done anywhere and we'll pay for it. And a guy came in, got his physical done. It was done by a DC. They said, no, we're not going to pay you for a DC doing it. It's got to be an MD. And, and yeah, I there's like, wow. There's little pockets of that really in a lot of it. I mean, when I was the, I used to be the executive director of the Ohio State Chiropractic Association and out of nowhere, we had an issue just with school bus drivers. And it was, you know, there, there's, there's pockets of this all over. The problem is we're not, as a profession, we typically don't have the resources or the mechanism to quickly respond to those things because a lot of them, they're, they're not hard fixes. It just takes a while. You got to be willing to put the effort and energy. But when you're looking as a state association of changing a major scope thing, and then you have this little thing, this goes away because you only have the resources to do this. That's the beauty of our organization where this is all we do. I don't have any other agendas other than to find little areas throughout our country and the world of where chiropractic is being limited and where there is, it's just oftentimes a clerical issue. Yes, there. I'm sure there's some bias at some point. I don't believe that exists as much as 
it did it one day. Now it's an issue of policy. And, and we just haven't done a very good job as a profession of cleaning that up over the last 25 years. And that is our mission is to get after these areas, whether it be a payer, we fought with Aetna about pediatrics them saying that they're not going to treat with anyone under six. So those are the types of things we look at as an organization. And we'll use our PR firm, our lobbyist, our attorneys, whatever resource we need from our, our, our team to make sure that we're creating those conversations and we're making the change. We're doing the very same thing within the military. We now have language that's getting put into the NDAA to make sure that chiropractors have the ability to treat our military, which currently doesn't exist. So those are the types of things that our organization takes on. And it's not about a belief system. It's about access. It's about making sure that whatever side of that aisle you want to live on within our profession, that you have the access that you deserve to have based on the education and the, and the guidelines within your state. So. I love it. I love everything that you're currently doing. And there sounds like a few other things that I might throw to you to keep your eye on as a, as a moving target that we can hit. Well, that's what we're here for. Not going to promise we'll take on everything people bring to us, but I want everything brought to us. And if it fits within our paradigm, then uh, <clears throat> we'll definitely do it. And I, I did see a quote there from Aaron. I want to be clear. I didn't say that I'm agnostic. I, I am not agnostic. I'm a Bible-believing man of God. Our organization is agnostic, just to be very clear. Uh, I want, don't want to give any misimpressions. But uh, but yeah, you know, we, uh, listen, we would, if this sounds good, obviously the only way we can do this um, is through our, our contributors. I would ask that you go to defendchiropractic.org, defendchiropractic.org. Um, you'll see there's an opportunity there. We just asked for $33 a month. Um, you know, you can cancel at any time. You're not committed for any period of time. Um, our goal is that reoccurring gener generate right now. We're right around 2,500 contributors. So we're generating a little over a hundred thousand dollars a month that, and we're just taking on battles all over the world. We're, as I said, we're in seven different countries. Uh, we have 52 attorneys on retainer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we take on stuff all over. Um, if you scroll down just a little bit there, doc. You can see that a little bit more. There you go. You can see those four countries. If you click on those, you'll see videos. Every week I update of the activity we're doing in each of those countries. So you can get an idea of, of the type of things that are happening around the world for chiropractic and the types of resources and things that we have available. So, so yeah, click that little orange button. Um, and uh, if, it's, if God's putting it on your heart, we'd sure love to have you a part of it. Um, you, you will uh, get Here's videos from me button. every single Monday. Um, if you become a contributor and we'll, uh, you know, we, we'd love to have you aboard. Well, you know, I'm going to encourage everybody to support this. Number one, Baron is going to join the meeting something for us and for DOT across the country that it would take years for the ACA or any of the other organizations to probably deal with. And yet we might be able to cut a path through this pretty quickly. Um, so I, I love this idea. I love this model and I'm going to support Baron. I hope everybody else, you know, this would be like a half of one DOT physical a month <laughs> that you could use to support Baron. So I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, give everybody the opportunity to try and support him. Um, well, I appreciate it. And then obviously Dr. Raker has a direct line to me. So, and any of you guys can as well, you just hit the contact us on the website that goes directly to me. Um, any, any ideas you guys have, if you know of issues, um, we want to be that, that special operation forces for the profession. We want to do the work that no one else really wants to do, has the resources or the time to do. Um, that's the stuff we're doing is all the dirty work. So we would, uh, we'd love to have your support financially, but even more importantly, staying connected and letting us know when things are going awry out there. Yeah, I am so glad that we ended up together down in Louisiana where I could catch you. I've been trying to catch you for a long time. <laughs> you're like a chicken. You're kind of hard to catch. Buddy, well, I'm a very busy man, but uh, I'm glad that we connected as well. All right. Is there anything else we need from Baron at this point? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but if you want, Baron, put your contact details in the chat room again, please. Yep. And that way we have everything there. Just that, to make that'd, sure be, that'd be saved and archived for anybody watching this not live on here, they can go back and look at it. Absolutely. If I could, I would like to make a comment. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, uh, Baron, this is the first I've met you, but I think you might need to look up the definition of agnostic. <laughs> okay. Am I using it wrong? I think you are, because uh, oh. what you said and you're, you know, uh, you, that you believe, they're not the same. It, the definition is that you don't believe in God. That's what the definition is. Uh, I, I apologize. I use the term agnostic for the purpose of our organization, meaning that, 
we're not married to vitalistic mechanistic. We're just doing the work to protect the rights of any practicing chiropractor, no matter what they believe as an individual. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not agnostic at all. So I, I will, I'll choose. Thank you for the clarity. I don't want to confuse anybody. Uh, but I, yeah, just as an organization, part of our issue between ACA, ICA, and any other, even our state associations that have two, is they seen that one's tied to one belief system over the other. That is not our case. I'll take on any issue. If someone's stopping someone from talking about what the adjustment does for the immune system, I'm going to fight that because we have data and research to prove it. But if someone wants to do DOTs or do those types of things and it's restricting you, we're going to fight for that too. So we're not we're just not tied to that whole belief system within the profession was my point. But uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the clarity on that. All right. <clears throat> Awesome. Thank, thank you for Baron for being on. I mean, you can hang on if you want and yeah, listen to some of the rest of this. Or if you got a place to go, you can go. Well, I do have another call in five minutes, so uh, I Perfect. appreciate it. And we're probably uh, gonna we'll update you know the network here as things progress, and you feed me data and info, and then maybe at some point in a month or two or whenever we have something big, I'll have you come back on and announce it. Hey, that sounds great. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Baron. All right, thanks everybody. God bless. See you. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm looking up, trying to look for the question. Uh, someone asked what the waiting period is for a TIA. I believe I don't believe it's a one-year waiting period. Um, I'm mm -hmm. looking through the uh, for training right now. I did cover that, uh, but I can't remember which module we have it in. So, so you're kind of scrolling as you go. So I'm scrolling through, <clears throat> looking for it, and so. <clears throat> What have you got? Uh, nine, nine hours out of the 12 completed? On nine that? hours out of 75% completed. You think I would know exactly where this is, but it's in the, uh, in the cardiovascular part. So while we're waiting on that, we're going to talk about blood surveillance and see if I can get an answer for that. It should be in here. And uh, we'll have a quick reference guide too that we can uh, reference. <laughs> Let's talk about blood surveillance, one of my favorite subjects. Okay, blood surveillance. Now, blood surveillance is, a, is one of those things you probably have never heard of. You said, why would I want to do that? And that is a specialty kind of niche area. Now, not everybody is going to get that kind of business, but some people will get a lot of it depending on the area or the, or the area or territory that you work in. Because we find that these, uh, these blood surveillance requirements that OSHA requires are uh, specific for certain jobs and occupations, okay? So I'm gonna go, we're gonna go to our blood surveillance folder and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, let me see if I can get there. I'm trying to do way too many things here. Let's go back to my drive and go into stuff for doctors. Now, some of you are new to Ahmed for DCs. Uh, if you're a, uh, a visitor, you can't get through this portal without a login information. If you want information on how to become a member and get all of our free stuff in here, like uh, the CRL lab contract, the McKesson freebie stuff, let us know. We'll be glad to give you an opportunity to participate. So go into Stuff for Doctors, and we're going to uh, go into medical surveillance. Okay. And let me, am I sharing screen or not? Okay. Can everybody see this? I hope we can. So, Go through stuff for doctors, then you're going to open folder medical surveillance. In here, it talks about the various surveillances which are done, which are required by OSHA. And the one we want to talk about today is blood surveillance. Okay. Blood surveillance. This is a very, uh, is a very important thing. As you know, uh, you can ingest chemicals. You can drink them in your water. You can eat them as a part of your food. You can uh, come in contact with this, with these uh, chemicals, which are cancer causing as a result of your occupation. And it could be anything from working in a lead smelting factory 
which these guys are all tested. They're tested biannually, I think. And OSHA is strict guidelines on uh, checking their blood for these certain chemicals. Firefighters are required to have blood surveillance. If they're a firefighter and they are uh, a city municipality and are they're working at a refinery as a firefighter, they're gonna have to have phenol and uh, benzenes tested every, every six months, okay? And so uh, the guidelines are in here. Now we've got the NIOSH pocketbook here. This talks about all the, uh, the chemical hazards which are out there, which people need to uh, uh, be familiar with. So this is typically what happens. You're doing physicals, you're doing drug and alcohol testing. And somebody calls you said, hey, you're doing our drug and alcohol testing. We just got to notice that uh, you know our guys are doing the uh, bridge abatement. They're going to tear down the old bridge, and that old bridge is painted with lead paint. And so all of our guys now are going to need lead-based uh, uh, blood uh, uh, surveillance for lead. Okay. And so what do you tell them when you they ask you to do this? You can say, "Sure, I can do it." There's a little bit of a hurdle with about drawing the blood, uh, and uh, how do we get around that in some of the states? We talked about this before. Uh, well, there, you know, obviously there are those states that chiropractors can draw blood. And that's, I want to say, a majority of states. If you have a state that you can't draw blood, but you can write the order for lab work, you can then hire like a phlebotomist or somebody to actually do the blood draw. You write the order, they go do the blood draws and send it to the lab. <clears throat> We've got all the forms you need. Everything is already built out. We've been here, done this. Down in Corpus Christi, we had a, a, a large industrial complex down there where lead exposure was all the time. We had one company, they rebuild drive shafts for luxury uh, uh, cruise liners. So you can imagine how big the drive shafts are. A part of that is, is they had to dip, they had to dip these drive shafts in hexavalent chromium to chromium to coat the like a plating a, a plating to protect uh, the uh, from from rust and corrosion, and then they used lead smelting as a part of this as well. So they had to be tested for hexavalent chromium, lead, and and so with these values we would do the blood tests, send them out to the lab, bring them back, and they would <clears throat> come back with the value. Okay, and how hard is this to do? You just look up the values under the OSHA guidelines and there's two stop points. Well, literally, literally when you get the reports back from say LabCorp, it says, here's your normal values. Here's, you know, if it's above normal, then it gives you the, the exposure values where to say, you know, this is a bad exposure. This is like, you know, refer them out to be evaluated immediately. So it it does it sounds a lot harder than it is. You draw the blood, or in some cases, like chromium and some of these heavy metals are actually urine tested also. Sometimes you got to do blood and urine. You just send it to the lab. The lab report comes back and tells you either their amount is in the normal values or it's outside the normal values. And they usually even print right there on the form. And a little bit out, they don't care, but they'll they'll tell you what the um, kind of like the threshold of an ex yeah. occupational exposure is. There's a minimum exposure threshold. Now, believe it or not, we're exposed to lead every day. Uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, the, the uh, OSHA got serious about this in the 1950s. They sampled, I think over 10,000 people across the United States for lead uh, levels. Now, remember we had lead in gasoline. They that had was lead in makeup, lead in lipstick. They had lead in, lead in paint and they checked everybody and they the average was 80 parts per million and so the osha threshold minimum is maximum is 40 so it scared the bejesus out of the federal government said man we got a big problem here and so they strict guidelines on lead from that point forward and then we actually it took another 10 or 15 years to eliminate lead out of gasoline it wasn't until the mid 70s they did that and so lead's a big problem. So if you tested uh, 25 of these workers, they may test 25, 30 on the scale. Once you reach a certain point, a threshold of say 40, 
then there an action needs to occur and it's called an action step. The first action step is to notify the employer, notify the employee. How do you do that? With letters. I have letters written in here on, uh, now ZPP is another uh, test that they do. Typically a ZPP will be elevated pr right prior to uh, lead. And so we have the reference guide here and this is what we do. This is Jimmy Lacefield. We tested him and look at that. His uh, ZPP is out of range. That's a, that is a clue that tells you that lead and that he is ex exposed to uh, some sort of lead because that's an inflammatory response that the body gives off, okay? And so we have all these values written down and we have the letter written and it's ready to go uh, to the uh, medical advisor at the company. And uh, you can see Dr. These are Dr. Ashbrook, Dr. Brandon, Dr. Raker. So these values here, uh, uh, now this was our letterhead, but uh, it's, it's real simple to fill in the blanks from the lab test. And so with regard to lead, your state has to be notified. Now the, in your state, the county health department may regulate this. They may oversee this portion of it. What, what we're required to do in Texas is notify the state that we have an employee exposed to lead. What they do is they go to work and they check with the employee that was exposed to lead and they come out and test the children in the house for free, okay? They wanna know if he's bringing lead home with him on his clothes. And this is very critical for people that's, that uh, are doing surface preparation, they're sanding and buffing, and they're uh, atomizing all this lead into sp small particles, they, they get some on their clothes and they bring it home with them. And they contaminate everything in the house, including the children, which is very dangerous for brain development if they have lead poisoning. So what's another big one? What's another big industry? It's oil and gas. Exposure to benzenes. You know, when you're pumping gasoline and you're smelling those fumes, those are benzenes, okay? And if enough exposure to that, it's going to elevate in your liver and it can cause leukemia, it can cause liver cancer, and it can cause a whole host of nasty things. And research has shown that people, uh, petroleum uh, workers exposed to benzene have a higher risk of multiple myeloma. That's a direct connection, okay? So it's important that you do the testing. So if you've got a fuel company that they're delivering fuel all over the, the, the town and they have one driver has uh, four or five stops to load up the fuel and to unload the fuel, talk to the company, a safety supervisor and say, hey, well, who's doing your lead testing for you, for your drivers? They should be tested. They're required to have a mask too. So you're going to be getting masks for that as well. So, yeah, so industry-wide, I mean, it, it's actually, you know, it's more prevalent in certain areas, but don't count your town out just because there's always these chemicals around. You've got your firefighters in every town have to be dealing with this. Um, there's probably, you know, some petroleum distribution, you know, some guy coming through and filling up tanks here and there in your town. Um, lead, because of old buildings, if you live in a town that has a lot of old houses from the 50s, 60s, 70s, I'm not sure when they finally took the lead out of the paint. But, you know, if, if you have people doing remodeling, if you have patients that remodel old houses, they can tie into some of this lead paint and start, you know, demolition in a house and not really wearing a good respirator. They could get into lead. Um, potentially in certain old buildings, they could get into asbestosis. Asbestos. Or that's asbestos. A bad, that's a bad one. And so uh, if you're flipping houses on yourself, number one, you need a hazmat suit. If you're going and doing a demo, you need a respirator. You need a hazmat suit to protect you from doing this. Well, OSHA employees, uh, are very important that they have protection of their skin, protection of their eyes. They have to have, because some of this stuff is absorbed through the skin. <clears throat> Okay. Well, and, and hazmat crews, who's, what's a hazmat crew? That's the guys, it could be private company, it could be uh, city, county uh, employees, could be state employees, but these are the guys that if there's a spill, if a truck wrecks in the city or out on the highway, if there's a spill of some kind, they're the guys that show up with the Tyvek suits and everything, 
these workers all have to be tested on a yearly basis for this stuff uh, to make sure they're not getting accidentally poisoned. Um, so the business is everywhere, just like with DOT truck drivers. It's really everywhere. It's in small towns with the firefighters and the hazmat crews. It's in bigger towns that have distribution, maybe with oil and gas distribution centers. There's, there's really a lot of this around that you just don't know it's right. there until you start looking for it. One of the things is, you know, it's like everything else. You, you, you think you're only doing DOT physicals and drug and alcohol tests, but like Wayne says, all of a sudden, if you have a trucking company that has to uh, move hazardous materials, those drivers usually have to have respirators because there may be a spill, there may be a, a leak, there may be a problem. They probably have to have some of this uh, heavy metal assessment. You know, there's, there's all these things start to wrap together. You think you're just going to do a DOT physical and get the guy in and out. But really, there may be more stuff to do. PFTs, hearing testing, ear cleaning, heart arrhythmias and murmurs. And now we're discovering that they may need to wear a respirator because they're, they're, they're uh, hazardous placard. What's, they, they have to carry hazardous materials. So they, mm -hmm. it's like a special endorsement. They have to get hazard uh, endorsed. It's, it's much more difficult. To get a hazmat so the, endorsement. So there's more yeah. stuff to do. These guys need it and you can provide it. It's not hard at all. Yeah. So it can be anything. It can be anybody from that makes nitro gloves. Let's say you got a factory, they're making nitro gloves. Or let's say they're wor they're working in food preparation and they have to they have to have chlorinated types of products in there. Uh again, these exposures, you, you may not think that there's nobody in my town that would need this. There's always somebody there's in all, your town. There's always somebody exposed to I mean, something out there. I mean, I mean, you can start with the fire department and say in every single town, the fire department has to deal with this. Well, and, it, if they have to respond to a fire that involves a petroleum product, <laughs> let's say that a, a garage uh, mechanics uh, shop has gone up and there's fire in there and there's solvents in there, they have to go put it out. They're going to have to have blood testing after that fire. Yep. They fight that fire because they're exposed to talk to in a toxic environment. Even right. though they have breathing apparatuses, that smoke gets on their skin, on their on their body, and they need testing for that. Okay, I, I'm going through the whole list of chemicals, uh, and it, honestly, it scares the heck out of you to see all this stuff. But you're only in the, be, you're only in the A's. I'm only in the A's, and it, it could be in our water. It could there's, be there's hundreds, if not thousands, of chemicals that have to be dealt with. We we've created in our humankind a lot of chemicals that just really weren't in nature, yeah, and now now we've made them or made them concentrated in areas that normally wouldn't happen, and now we have to test for them. That's it, and so it's it's simple. Usually blood draws, sometimes a urinalysis sent to the lab. You get a report back. It either says it's in the normal range or it's not. You know what else the lab, the report has on every one of these? It has normal range for normal people. Mm -hmm. And it has a normal range for who? Who's the other group that it always puts on there? Smokers. Smokers. Smokers always have a different, higher normal range. Right. And it's because all the plants absorb these out of the air and the soil. And when you smoke them, it gets into your system. So they're at a much higher uh, level in a smoker than a non-smoker. And they have to actually put those on the lab test values to show you normal, right. smoker normal, and then exposure, and then occupational exposure. And if you get one that goes abnormal into that occupational exposure all you do is inform the company inform the person and then maybe inform a public health like a county health or state health committee and and refer the person tell the person all you got to do is go check in with your doctor and show them these lab values he will take care of you at the threshold level what has to happen is the first notice is sent out the safety manager has to take action uh it's not a recordable yet Okay, let's be clear on that. But he has to take action. He's going to have to improve the PPP. Uh, he's going to have to improve. They have uh, to find out why they, they got exposed, how they get exposed and how to stop it from happening again. Right. They may have to move him to a different department, not take him off of work, but move him out of that environment uh, for a while and getting retested. And then the, the testing parameters, and they're going to be tested every month. 
uh, so, until the values go down. So there's there's a lot of testing that once you hit a positive, you may have to be retested multiple times. If they test over 80, I know for lead, then it becomes a recordable because they're going to have to have some form of chelation. So now the now an occupational health physician is going to get involved uh, because that is person's going to have to be pulled off of the job and pay, taken out of work and sent somewhere for additional lab work and uh, uh, possible chelation to have some of that lead reduced in a, in a serious manner. This is something that came up at Corpus Christi when we were there. I just remembered this. You know, there's arsenic, there's inorganic, and then there's organic. We got a call from a mining company, and they said, do y'all do testing for arsenic? And what did we what do we tell you? I said, yes, we do. And then I called Dr. Racker. I said, hey, they want me to do arsenic testing. How do we do that? Well, there's a blood test that you can do. Well, how you know, I didn't know the difference between inorganic and organic. It, you know, this is when you need to do your homework. If someone asks you a question, you're not quite sure how to answer it. You say, I can help you with that. Let me give you a call back. You do a little research. Talk to Dr. Raker or me. And let's put our heads together and see how we can attack this. Then you call the safety man back and you say, Mr. Safety Man, did you mean organic arsenic or inorganic? And he's going to be like, oh, I didn't know you knew the difference. Okay. Well, if they're mining and they're digging up a hole and there's there's trace elements of arsenic, they're going to have to have tested. They're going to have to have blood testing for uh, for arsenic. So you may work, they may work in a uh, in a uh, rat pellet factory. Uh, packing pellets full of arsenic for uh, rat poison or something. Those people got to be uh, have got to be blood tested as well. So they, I mean the the list is endless. These these chemicals are everywhere. Now they, let's talk about who does the draw. In your office, you had do you have a phlebotomist? I just have a trained medical assistant. A trained medical assistant. In, in my state, as long as somebody's trained to draw blood, they just go through a weekend class at the college. They can draw blood. I can draw blood and I can order blood draw. So right. well, um, I we, just have a trained assistant. We didn't have that luxury. So what we had to do, we had a local college that taught phlebotomy and they rotated for free, no charge, rotated their people through to get clinical experience, to get clinical experience. And so about, about every two or three weeks, we would get a new phlebotomist coming in and they were already trained in experience before they ever got to us. And so they would draw they would tell us things about blood that I didn't even know about. And so, uh, but it's getting it in the right tube. Each of those tubes are color coded. They have specialized chemicals. Some of them need to be refrigerated. Some of them need to be covered in tin foil. They can't be exposed to light. And so learning those little, little nuances in doing this business is something that uh, you've got to learn if you want to do blood surveillance. And it's not a, it is not difficult. It's very profitable. Because we charged $180, $190 for, uh, say, a lead test. And I think uh, the charge was $75. And, so here's, we were, and here's the good and part. And we were doing it on every employee twice a year. You know, earlier on last year, we got this contract with, I think his name was Bob Hall through LabCorp. It's, like it's kind of like a Sam's Club discount. Under his group, my heavy metal prices dropped in half. So you can get these heavy metal prices through Bob Hall and LabCorp. What used to cost right. like forty dollars for like a heavy metal test, one of the metals may now only cost like 10, 15 bucks. And you can charge like 60, 70. Um, so you're making like every time she draws a, a, a metal on somebody, and some of them need four or five metals, you're making like 40 bucks a metal. So you could be making two hundred dollars for just ordering some blood work and sending it to the lab. Yeah, how hard is that? How oh, hard is that? That's difficult, man. So uh, it, the work's out there. You just got to be able to, don't be afraid to do it. Uh, you can do it. Yep. Okay. And a lot of see, a lot of companies like Concentra and the urgent care centers, they're into treating patients. This is just, this is just like a pain in the ass for them. To, and this is the problem, see, they we get to, you'll get to call and they'll say, I don't want my guy sitting down there for three hours for you to draw a tube of blood. Come on. Uh, that's what they get at Concentra. So that's where we certainly can beat them on it. Okay. Let's answer a few of your questions out there. Uh, we're talking, we've got doctors doing uh, sidebar meetings on the, in the chat room. I <laughs> uh, would rather you not do that. 
okay? Uh, Aaron Corley, uh, if you want to know what the cost of 3D exam is or, or you know, don't do it here. Uh, call us, uh, talk to me or talk to Rich Fry. Uh, but we want to know what your comments are on occupational medicine. I'm sure you got a lot of questions out there. So let's keep it to, the, to our subject of occupational medicine so we can help our doctors out there, okay? So, uh, doctor, you have any comments on, I'm still curious about uh, the- uh, What? Uh, the TIA. Um, I'm, I'm too, I, since we're building this new DOT certification and some of these rules have fluxed on us a little bit, I'm going to go back just, I don't want to give an answer that I'm not pretty dang sure of. I do know that they, um, you know, they changed the waiting period for surgeries post-surgeries. There really is no waiting period. It's now just clearance from you and the surgeon. I, I don't know if they kind of did the same thing with, uh, what did you say ask me about? TIE. T T T I TIAs. I don't know exactly where that's at, but uh, I'm going to look at it and we'll we'll make sure and give a we'll good get, answer. We'll get an that. answer next week. We're pretty close to having our, um, I'm looking at it now. <laughs> It's looking pretty good. We just need to get to uh, get that twelve hour. Delivery. We got to get that database in so that we can type in T, uh, TIA and and get it uh, get that answer real quick. Okay. Was there any other uh, questions in the chat room that I need to look at really quick? We got ten minutes left, and I can answer some questions there. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that was the waiting periods on strokes, blah, blah, blah. We're going to look that one up. So Kevin Miller will get an answer for that next week and have that on. What else? Do, do, do. Now, have... this is a is very is strange. Why, why is uh, the state of Kansas, the chiropractic association, I mean, why are they just chiropractic physicians just for – DOT physicals, either you are or not. I mean, uh, you know, can you advertise chiropractic physician? Michael McIrvin, can you give us an answer on that? I, you know, if they allow you to use the term for DOT, how are they going to keep it off your advertising? I mean, yeah, I mean, you should uh, be able to. What about other <laughs> other forms of exams? <laughs> I could see a video or a television commercial where somebody said, I'm a physician, but only for DOT exams. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. It is. It's a, but, you know, our profession is always on that quasi line. We're not really doctors, according to everybody else. We're not really nurses. We're not really anything. Who knows what we are? It's all crazy. If the ACA and or the new Medicare law gets passed and that all kind of trickles down, that's going to, I think, get some of this out of the way. Once again, it's going to kind of nationally federalize our what we are, or what we're called and how we work. So I, I really don't deal with Medicare a whole lot and could care less about Medicare, but passing that statute may trickle down and help us. Yeah, it, it does trickle down to this from, state. From too. that angle. When I told Barron about the fact that all these federal agencies, like some of them would let us do stuff, physicals, and other ones wouldn't. He's like, well, hell, we need to investigate that and open that up. I've been trying to do that for the last 10 years, and I finally got somebody has got the, the, the money and the know-how and the lawyers to go after some of this. So Barron is going to be cool. You know, for years, chiropractors couldn't do school bus physicals in Texas. They, and it was Why? Because they wrote into their little rules that physicians, MDs, DOs, uh, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants were the only ones that could do them. They just left us out. And then suddenly... They started adopting the federal uh, it, it, it guidelines. Came, it came once there was a federal um, certification and they realized that we were qualified, knew what we were doing, that the head people at Texas said, then you can do those. If only if your DOT qualified them. If you were a th DC that was not DOT certified, they wouldn't let you do the school bus driver physical. Yeah. So it, it, it all trickles down. It's we're really moving in a good direction. Okay, let's go. Uh, let's go. There, there's your transit ischemic attack right there. Let's just go into it and see what it says here. A transient ischemic attack, or TIA, 
is a focal loss of blood supply to one portion of the brain. Usually, it lasts more than a few seconds, but most are less than 20 minutes. Symptoms can persist for 24 hours. The definition of ATIA, according to FMCSA standards, is that resolution of all symptoms must be complete. The risk of having a future event is highest during the first weeks and months after having a TIA, and then the risk declines in about one year to a 5% yearly risk of having a seizure. Risk of a recurrent event can be reduced by surgical intervention. Those who have had ATIA have a mandatory waiting period of one year and can be certified to drive if they complete the waiting period, are seizure-free, and off anti-seizure medication. They must have a normal physical exam, neurological exam, including neuroophthalmological evaluation and neurophysiological testing, and they must have clearance from a neurologist. So there's, there's a lot Drivers with a history of TIA who cannot be certified are those who have not completed their waiting period or if they use an oral anticoagulant medication for treatment. They must also not use any drug that has a potential high rate of complications to affect safe driving such as depression, and they must have clearance from the neurologist. Medical examiners can, on a case-by-case -case basis, obtain additional tests and consultation in regards to whether a driver is fit for duty. If the driver meets all of the recommendations for certification, they can be certified up to a period of one year. Okay, does that answer your Traumatic question? brain or spinal cord injury okay, is let's... described as. All right, there's a little bit of a taste of our training that we're, work, we're still working on. We still need to iron the bugs out, but we're getting there. All right. Uh, All right, any other questions is coming up? we got five minutes. I had one question come in on, somebody called me, and this is this loops back around every once in a while. What happens when I'm running a consortium? I call the company, and they don't send a driver in. And they've done it to me more than once. Mm -hmm. What do I do? And I was like, you know what? First of all, when you first sign them up in your consortium, I would I, I would go back and make a, a piece of paper that you put with it and you go over it with them. And it says very in big, bold, clear fonts. When I call, you send your drivers. That's a mandate. That's what this is. And then once you sign them up in your consortium, and if they continue to try and not send people when you call for them, this is simple. I don't, I don't waste any time. I don't call them. I don't talk to them. I don't know anything. I call my DOT auditor, Gary Grigg, and I give Gary their name and their phone number and tell them what they're doing. He calls them and he says, you either send your drivers or I'm coming down there and I'm pulling every piece of paper and auditing you for the last 10 years, and you're going to end up with a big fine. Enough said. Yeah. So that's all you do. If you have a problem with somebody not sending drivers, you call, you find out who your DOT auditor in your state is, and you tell him what the problem is. Like, they're the cops. If you've seen somebody committing a crime, you would call the police and they would go intervene. Right. right. These people are basically committing a crime by not doing the random pulls. They're endangering the safety of everybody involved. You call the cops, who in this case is the DOT auditor. Give them their name and number. He'll call them and he'll tell them straight up. This is the law. This is the mandate. You got to send drivers or I'm coming down there. And you won't be having a business anymore if I shut your door. I got one question or one thing here. Aaron Corley asked if uh, you could build your Ahmed, Ahmed business by doing public speaking. It just so happens Dr. Riker did some public speaking and built his business. We've got that in here. Uh, Let's go into stuff for doctors and say, Dr. Raker, it, what, what organization was it? I think it's the Chamber? Chamber of Commerce right there. Where? Right there. Sure. I mean, public speaking is an easy form. In fact, I'm putting together right now, um, here's, here's the basic program, and you can kind of do it on what you want. I'm, I'm doing a lecture on, a, like a lunch lecture, one hour on... 10 ways to reduce your healthcare expenditures. I'm gonna do it in conjunction with a charity. You find a charity that needs a little money. They put their name on this. You go to a, a, an event manager like the Chamber of Commerce or maybe a community college. You tell them, well, here's what I want. This charity needs money. I'm gonna do a free lecture. I need you to 
you know, posted and held it at your, uh, your event hall. Mm -hmm. And anybody that comes, my lecture is free, but anybody that comes, if they donate, if they put, you know, a dollar in the donate box to the charity, they're in a, they're get a ticket and they're in a drawing or raffle for a free vacation that Jeff Sassano can get. And he can get them anywhere. They could be to Vegas. It could be to San Diego. It could be to Cancun. It could be to Hot Springs, Arkansas. It could be Branson, Missouri. It can be anywhere you want to want to have it. But anybody that comes and donates to the charity gets a ticket in the draw for this free vacation. And it should work wonders. It gets you in front of people, telling them what they can do to lower, you know, their healthcare rates. You could talk about. You know, simple subjects like just how to reduce their work comp injuries. I'm going across the board with any kind of work, healthcare wise. Um, you can make it as long or as short as you want, but it, it brings people in, it gets money to the charity, it gets your name recognition. And once you do this, I, I really think this is something that you should do probably once every month or two and just keep new businesses. Any new business that wants to save money on something healthcare related. If you can give them just three, four, five little pearls, they should come to you and say, hey, I'm interested in saving some money like you're talking about. What do I do? How do I do this? And you should say, well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to sign up to send all your DOT stuff to me. That'll save you money. Number two, if you got work injuries and you want to save money, you send those to me. Number three, if you got health care injuries or just right. em employees that need help, you know, lowering their blood pressure, lowering their sugar with their back injuries, whatever. So they show up every day and they're not in the doctor's office, send them to me. Now, this is your, your PowerPoint presentation. We put it on here so that you can use it. Uh, you can take this PowerPoint. This is a Google PowerPoint and uh, Google-based uh, uh, PowerPoint, and you can change it and make it your own and take Dr. Record's uh, program on recordables and give a talk, give a lecture yeah. on, and this is how you pick up the companies. All the safety people are going to be there. And so uh, don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have to, you, you know, just take what we've done before and listen to, you know, listen to the audio recording of Dr. Riker speaking, uh, type out the script, practice it a few times, and then go out and do it. And basically, okay. you just read your own slides. It's just real easy. Just read them and just turn around and face the audience once in a while. It, does, it makes you look like a genius and you don't have to know anything. You just kind of read them through it. If you talk to a company owner or a safety man and just say the word, how can I reduce your recordables? He's going to, his ears are going to perk up. Yep. So he wants to talk to you because that's what he's interested in. Anybody's a member that can get that in the member section and, and use it. Yeah. So it's in the member section. All right, guys. Uh, I got great news about October. You know what happens in October? It's Oktoberfest. I thought you were going to say Halloween. Well, that too. I may dress up this year for Halloween, but I, I want to say this. So we're not going to be able to drink any beer on the job, just to let you know. But we're going to have Oktoberfest. That is going to include Anna and Madison are going to talk about all things about online marketing and all the backdoor stuff that they have to do to, to get your organic values up. She's going to educate you on what uh, the click-through rate is, and what conversion rate means and what uh, organic and inorganic value means and authority links and, and all these things that are important to your website. All these elements that you have to have in your, uh, in your website for Google to recognize you, okay? And so uh, they're gonna be here hopefully every week in October for 30 minutes, uh, educating you on, on how to do these online markets. And this is even above our head on this stuff. They have to, they're experts in that stuff. So they're the ones who are going to talk uh, about it and they're going to, they're going to create the program and, uh, and then we'll record that too and put it in the, on the Lunch and Learn archives. All right, All right. guys, we'll see you next week. If you miss any part of this show, you may have gotten here late and not, not heard the uh, Carpeting Defense Fund, go to the Lunch and Learn archives. I will post it there and you can download it on your phone, on your laptop. Everybody your go sign up for that and support him for, yes, that's for a, a year. Yes, $33 a month you'll spend. Yep. All right, guys, we're going to let you go. See you next